Welcome to Capital Update, your review of state government for this last week in August. I'm Teresa Marsenberg. Statewide Florida reached more than 615,000 COVID-19 cases. But in the past two weeks, the positivity rate for new cases has stayed below 10%. That's according to reported numbers from the Department of Health. In hard-hit Miami-Dade, they're planning on reopening indoor dining by August 31st with specific protocols, like ensuring proper airflow by keeping windows open. As more sectors reopen, Governor DeSantis toured the state this week in a series of industry events. I think that uh, you know, the approach of one, protecting the vulnerable, which we've done, two, supporting our hospitals, making sure they have what they need, but then three, keeping society functioning um, is an approach that, that served us well. We're going to continue to do that. But the picture on a local level has given some pause. In Martin County Tuesday, commissioners voted three to two to reinstate a mask mandate. The order, they say, is in response to an increase in cases since the reopening of schools there and pleas from medical professionals. But a number of citizens showed up in opposition. But there is a move all over this country and people are getting ready to push back and revolt. I just want to let you know. Most of us will do it kindly, but we will not just bow and lay down to this. Amen. Amen. The people are good. The court order simply stated the obvious. Schools should reopen when the local decision makers determine upon advice of medical experts that it is safe to do so. Weeks after the first schools in Florida began complying with the July 6th order by the state to open classrooms or lose state funds, Florida's largest teachers union claimed victory. On Monday, August 24th, Judge Charles Dotson ruled that Education Commissioner Richard Corcoran engaged in ad hoc and unconstitutional decision making without considering local safety and the medical opinions of experts, local or otherwise. As expected, the state appealed to a higher court, which triggered an automatic stay on Judge Dotson's ruling. But on Thursday, Dotson once again sided with the teachers union and vacated that stay, reemphasizing that Corcoran's unconstitutional action requiring the statewide reopening of schools during the month of August places people in harm's way. According to the Department of Health stats, some 9,000 kids have been infected with COVID since schools reopened August 10th. 
And on Thursday night, the Supreme Court was asked to weigh in. Corcoran and the governor believe they will ultimately win, and if not, they maintain the majority of parents who want their kids back in school are on their side. And so, too, is time. If the appeals court rules against the state, you know, I don't know, in three weeks, those districts, they're going to, they're, the parents are going to still want to have that option. So functionally, it's not really going to change. Those assertions, along with the continued threat of losing money, played out in one of the state's larger school districts Friday morning. If we do not follow the emergency order, as many speakers have spoke about, we could lose close to $200 million um, within the organization, over $200 million. During an emergency meeting in Hillsborough County, school board members voted 5-2 to two not to delay in-person learning. Friday's vote reversed a previous plan to require three more weeks of e-learning, a plan that was rejected by the state. But once again in play, after the judge confirmed this week that it should be a local decision. Certainly our community is, is yearning for some stability, some sense of normal. So, the final decision in Hillsborough. Face-to-face -face will resume August 31st. And with over 360 positive COVID cases in the school district heading into the weekend, Tampa area leaders now join school officials all across the state who on a daily basis scramble to track COVID cases in schools, work to keep students and teachers safe, and dread what some fear is the inevitable. I hate to even say it, but uh, there may be a death rate. Um, you know, the we we have to be we have to make this information out there for the uh, public to know in my mind uh, the full scope of what we're dealing with i'm josie barroso most of florida's public universities started school this week but because of health safety protocols schools are taking the environment on campus looks much different from a year ago Florida's public universities all have some sort of hybrid course schedule for the fall semester. At Florida A&M, 75% of classes were online with 25% in person. COVID has made this campus like a ghost town. So last year it was very um, like lively, like it was just a lot of people everywhere. So now it's like a shock, kind of. And on Monday, August 24th, the first day back for a majority of schools, the popular video platform Zoom had a nationwide disruption causing delays for remote classes. Outside the classroom, disruptions of another kind were increasing the risk of spreading coronavirus even before school had started. We had parties that were impromptu parties and some that were planned. We were getting wind of it from students who were calling, letting us know. Alumni was letting us know. Parents were letting us know. And, you know, with this generation, they were posting on social media. And that Florida A&M implemented a temporary school-wide curfew for those living in dorms. School leaders want to avoid being the next UNC Chapel Hill, where an outbreak forced a return to fully remote courses. The school says students should practice safety precautions even when going off campus. And anyone who violates the rules could be put on probation, suspended, or expelled. It's there, and so we want the students to know that we're serious about this because this is a, a national pandemic, and we're trying to make sure that we protect the family here. So we want to make sure not only students, but you know, staff, um, people in Tallahassee, Leon County, and the fact that if students were to go somewhere else and go home, protect their family at home as well. Next door, Florida State University is trying to control a similar problem. There was at least one confirmed coronavirus case from a weekend party where several students were arrested for serving alcohol to underage students. FSU President John Thrasher sent a sternly worded letter to the student body warning the irresponsible and reckless behavior of a few puts any hope of the campus remaining open in jeopardy for all of us. Events on campus are now restricted to 10 students or less, too. And this week, the city, along with the local schools, debuted a Tallahassee pledge to encourage the community to commit to following guidelines on a daily basis. But it's just one of those things you might just have to tweak it or figure out a different way to have a good time. You don't, people don't just have a good time from having, throwing a, a big party, you know. So I think it's one of those things. It's difficult, um, but it's just comes back to leadership. Many schools around the state have also publicized their coronavirus case numbers on their websites. For Capital Update, I'm Josie Barros. I'm Mike Laquia. This week, the governor toured the state talking about keeping the Florida economy going and continuing things that Floridians love. Monday, he was on hand as the Miami Dolphins announced that football games would start in September with 13,000 fans in the stands. But not every fan is welcome. If you are someone that doesn't want to wear a mask, 
this isn't the place for you this year. Don't buy a ticket. Don't come. Also in Miami-Dade County, with new infections and hospitalizations dropping, local officials decided to allow restaurants to reopen beginning the final day of August. Our new patients going into the hospital were in the hundreds before today, just something like 60 people. The governor met with theme park executives on Wednesday. Central Florida has seen the worst job losses in the state, with unemployment rates at 17% in Orange County and 22% in Osceola County. Just the, not just thousands, not just tens of thousands, but really when you talk about these operations, hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, that are connected to the operations here. Park executives said the environments are safe being both outdoors and requiring masks. They pointed to fewer new infections in Central Florida since Disney opened in July. About 90% of full-time employees have returned, but the part-time help has not. We're hoping if we can increase visitation, increase our hours, increase capacity, we can bring those people back and get them working again. Theme parks say most visitors are coming by car. The governor hopes to open up flights from Brazil and Europe again and bring international tourists. Friday, he met with airline executives about increasing travel. If you had asked me at the beginning of March about flying, I would have said, well, gee, you're kind of in close contact. Someone sneezes. Isn't everyone going to get infected? And the fact of the matter is uh, the airplanes have just not been vectors where you've seen a lot of spread. This week, he also met with Tampa area business leaders. One high-end restaurant owner has seen business bounce back, mostly. Now we're seeing that you know business is really following the infection rate and what's you know what's happening on the daily basis. And and over the last few weeks, as the we've come back down, we've seen business start to increase again. At the port of Tampa, cruise ships have stopped, but the gap has been made up in other areas. We have seen our energy, fuel, petroleum products coming back. The building and construction industry very strong. Uh, we are even importing new products, lumber, steel products into, uh, and this is because of Florida's growth, our region's growth. The governor hopes these adjustments by various industries start to make Florida resemble the Sunshine State pre-pandemic. For Capital Update, I'm Mike Lacuya. Unemployed Floridians could see an additional $300 in their weekly payments. This week, the state applied for the extra funding available through FEMA. It replaces the $600 supplemental payments that expired last month. Uh, I spoke with the Secretary of Labor. I think it'll be favorably approved. So then we will be able to then turn around and then offer the enhanced benefit. Senator Jeff Brandis says it's good news considering people are still hurting financially and that due to budget limitations, the state is unlikely to expand benefits. But, uh, I think it's, it's positive. I think if the Fed's going to provide resources, the state, at least in this time, troubled time, should be looking to, to access those uh, as we get through this. The state expects to send out at least three weeks worth of payments, more if there's money left over. Only those who receive at least $100 in weekly benefits are eligible for the extra cash. 45,000 Floridians applied for unemployment last week, down from 72,000 initial claims filed the previous week. I'm Destiny Burt. After a series of meetings, a task force appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis finalized its recommendations to allow visitors back into nursing homes and other facilities with guidance, even allowing some to hug their loved ones again after a five-month ban on visitation. People are dying from the loneliness, from the failure to thrive. Soon, visitors would be able to do more than window visits and drive-by hellos. The task force created three groups for visitors, essential caregivers who help with bathing, dressing, or eating, compassionate caregivers who will provide emotional support during an end-of-life situation or hardship, and general visitors at least 18 years old. A resident can designate up to five general visitors. These facilities would only be open to visitors if they haven't had any new staff or resident COVID-19 cases in 14 days. Currently, 62% of facilities haven't had new cases since August 11th. Mary Daniel, a member of the task force whose husband is in a facility, insisted on allowing loved ones to at least have a hug from essential caregivers to help with their emotional support. I'm losing the very best time with him. Today is his best day. He will decline tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And I'm missing the time right now that he knows me and that he knows my love and he can feel it. And I'm missing that. And, and I, what am I saving him for, from? For, for a year from now when he's incontinent? 
However, Surgeon General Scott Rivkes was hesitant to agree. We may want to compromise. This virus does not compromise. This virus is spread by the breath. Uh, masks do not completely eliminate this virus. After much debate, members reached an agreement that visitors wearing proper PPE outlined by the CDC can get closer than six feet to a resident. The recommendations also suggest COVID testing should not be required. But if a facility provides rapid testing, visitors must comply. If there are any issues, the long-term care ombudsman will investigate complaints. I talked to the uh, long-term care ombudsman on a daily basis uh, on this issue, and he and his team have, uh, have stood ready to assist to the extent that they possibly could through telephones and faxes and emails. And now they stand ready to go back in and visit as necessary. They are the most strongest advocates for residents, you know, uh, apart from family, that you get out there. Ultimately, it would be up to each facility to determine the duration and frequency of visits. For Capital Update, I'm Destiny Burt. On Friday, faith groups joined state and local leaders urging Congress to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. The federal legislation aims to combat police misconduct, excessive force, and racial bias in policing. Several police shootings and killings of unarmed black people, including George Floyd and most recently Jacob Blake, have fueled ongoing protests in Florida and across the nation. 57 years ago today, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Representative Geraldine Thompson was in Washington for the 50th anniversary in 2013. She says seven years later, African Americans are still marching for equal rights and protection. And closer to home this week, Jacksonville remembered the 60th anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday. That day, a group of African-Americans organized sit-ins at local restaurants when a mob of whites with axe handles beat the demonstrators. Other African-Americans called the Boomerang Gang fought back in a brawl that lasted two hours. Before Hurricane Laura landed in Louisiana, Florida first responders were already on their way to help. This search and rescue team from Orange County left Central Florida Thursday with orders to head west. They picked up PPE supplies and made a pit stop at the State Emergency Operations Center Thursday afternoon. Florida's state fire marshal was there to thank them. That Florida's got the resources to be able to have these men and women come together literally at a moment's notice pack up, leave everything they've got, and deploy out to go save lives. It's a, it's, a, it's an incredible public service they provide, not just to the state of Florida, but the entire Gulf Coast. The highly trained team was requested through an emergency sharing agreement between Gulf Coast states. They may be there for two weeks, going door to door, making sure people are safe. They would do just the same for us as we would do for them in this case. So for that aspect and any aspect that we may have to, if it's high angle rescue, water rescue, collapsed buildings, we have the capabilities of being able to provide that. So whatever mission comes our way, we should be able to handle it. I'm Melissa Cleansing. In his final moments as chair of the Southwest Florida Water Management Board, Mark Taylor read a plea to his colleagues. But do not create a bad solution for a situation that does not need to exist. Stand firm. Florida's five water management districts can raise or lower your taxes. They have the power to decide how much water is pulled from the aquifer and by whom. Florida law requires 49 members to sit on the boards that make those and other decisions. There are only 33 now. It's been a year since Governor DeSantis made new appointments. Unless he acts, by the first week of September, as terms expire, only 25 board members will remain. I've been told we must travel, tread carefully not to upset the politics. And frankly, folks, I've been tempted to do that over the last 18 months behind the scenes, and I can assure you I've spent more time on this issue than I've spent on water policy or any part of the mission for the district. Taylor's board is supposed to have 13 members. It has nine with two of those terms expiring. The Suwannee River District will have only four of its required nine members without new appointments. The Northwest Florida District, three of nine, nowhere near a quorum unless you change the rules. The most widely suggested solution to this problem is to change the policy language to set the quorum to to the majority of the board currently appointed by the governor. This would mean after this week, the quorum here would be four members. In the St. Johns River Water Management District, after this week, a quorum would be two members. This is wrong and short-sighted. 
Taylor urged his board not to change the quorum rules. He also urged them not to delegate all their authority to the executive director, as some boards have already done. I've never seen anything like it. It is, to me, it is, it is completely unique. No, Jim Gross worked for years for the St. John's Water Management District and says he knows plenty of people who have applied for the vacancies. Some of the people I knew were, were going to bring about that, bring that sort of that knowledge and expertise on the environment and on the hydrology, the science and all those things and the biology. And, but I don't think those people are welcome anymore. When asked about the status of new appointments, the governor's office said he is committed to selecting the most qualified individuals to serve on these important boards and will continue to review applications until he is comfortable making these significant appointments. One person who does not expect to be reappointed is Mark Taylor. Although I've applied, but I suspect, especially after the comments I just made, it's unlikely. In today's climate, criticism doesn't go unnoticed. For Capital Update, I'm Melissa Cleansing. I'm Rebecca Baer. Florida pharmacists do a lot more than count pills, and soon many of them will play an even greater role in patients' health care. A new law will allow them to treat patients for certain chronic conditions under an agreement with the doctor. They'll also test and treat patients for illnesses like the flu. This week, the Board of Pharmacy approved rules governing the law, but a proposal to allow pharmacists to treat patients with heart failure drew debate. It was initially approved unanimously by the board's rules committee. Heart failure, we can make the most difference. We can reduce it, readmissions, um, or reducing costs, reducing stays. And every time you go back to the hospital, you're much more likely to get pneumonia or some other acquired um, disease from the hospital. So to me, it's a no-brainer. The proposal was sent to the full board for approval Wednesday. Doctors told them they're against adding heart failure to the list which also includes high cholesterol, hypertension, smoking cessation, and opioid use disorder, among other conditions already set out in the law. It's disappointing that the Board of Pharmacy has decided to move ahead with a disease that admittedly is a big problem in the state, but uh, you picked off something that, that has a high morbidity and mortality, and it's just not the place to start. If they challenge the rule, the board attorney said it could lead to administrative hearings and significant delays. Representative Tyler Saroy, the bill's House sponsor, has urged them to implement rules sooner rather than later, given the current health crisis. Fever, chills, body aches, fatigue. Well, we know those are all symptoms of the flu, but they also are symptoms of COVID-19. So our ability to, to offer testing uh, is going to be critical to continuing to slow the spread of COVID-19 and to slow the spread of the flu. Pharmacy board members voted 6-2 to two to leave heart failure off the list of conditions, at least for now. If this is a possible delay in implementing this rule, then th that slows down the ability to help all these other chronic conditions. You could still be collaborating in all these different areas while you're vetting out the one disease state. In addition to further discussions on heart failure, the board is also expected to consider adding mental health to the list of conditions that pharmacists can treat in partnership with a doctor. For Capital Update, I'm Rebecca Baer. Medical marijuana patients will soon have more options at the dispensary. The state has published rules for the production of edibles. They set out guidelines for what type of edible products can be sold and packaging standards, ensuring the products aren't attractive to children. Doctors at Canna MD, a network of clinics, were the first to certify a patient for edibles just hours after the rule took effect. I think it's going to be huge, um, second only probably to the rollout that we saw with Smokable um, in the recent past here. And the reason being is it really just removes that barrier for a lot of patients who might otherwise be hesitant to try medical marijuana because they don't want to um, inhale via smokable routes or vaping. Under the new standards, products can include baked goods, lozenges, chocolates, and drink powders. Dispensaries must get their products approved by the Department of Health. 
The Florida Veterans Hall of Fame Council has selected 20 names for the class of 2020. While the names still need the approval of the cabinet, it includes one Floridian who became an astronaut after flying in Vietnam. Norm Thaggart spent months in the Soviet space station Mir in the 1980s. Also selected was Lieutenant Colonel Alton Yates of Jacksonville. In the Air Force, he volunteered to be a test subject. In one experiment, he rode a high-velocity sled. It felt like everything that was in my body was trying to come out through the front. And I remember when it hit the brake and finally came to a stop, I breathed a sigh of relief. The Supreme Court of Florida ruled this week that the governor exceeded his authority when he appointed a judge to their bench who had not yet served 10 years as a member of the Florida Bar. But they let the appointment of Judge Renatha Francis stand. Representative Geraldine Thompson's lawsuit asked that the nominating commission put together a new list of candidates from the application pool, but the court said there's no law that allows that option. One had been a member of the Bar for 36 years, another 34 years, 20 20 years, whatever. But the only one that they recommended and nominated had less than 10 years. And here's a look at more state government action this week. I'm Giovanni Hampton. This year marks 100 years since the 19th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution, giving women the right to vote. Secretary of State Laura Lee thanked the pioneers of the amendment. She says because of that monumental victory for women in the United States, across Florida, more women are in leadership, making advances in science, technology, and the arts. 100 years after the 19th Amendment was ratified and beyond, women continue to help shape the trajectory of our nation and our world through their leadership. The 19th Amendment was certified on August 26, 1920. Many state-sponsored events to celebrate this milestone were canceled due to the impacts of COVID-19. But on Wednesday, Florida National Organization for Women invited lawmakers to a virtual event to remember those who worked tirelessly to end discrimination against women across the U.S. Because of those sacrifices, we've come so far. But I think it's really important to recognize that we still have so far to go. Representative Osley says while steps have been taken to achieve a more just and equal United States, the coronavirus pandemic is uncovering fault lines that existed in our society for far too long. Decades of cuts to public health, a child care system that doesn't work, a very broken unemployment system, and centuries of systemic and structural racism that have created enormous disparities across our communities. These lawmakers agreed. Women's Equality Day reminded America of the strides women have made, but also reminds America of the struggles many, especially women of color, continue to face. Well, the problem is over 70% of Americans believe that equal rights based on sex already is protected. Guess what? It's not. We know that because women, particularly minority women, are paid much less than their male counterparts, Mothers like mine have a much tougher time putting food on the table. And the impacts just don't impact women, they impact their children. Children like me who grew up uh, under the strong, uh, strong parenting of a single mother. In the 1920s, after the passage of the 19th Amendment, advocates began a new campaign, a push to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, a proposed amendment to the United States Constitution designed to guarantee equal rights for all regardless of sex. The ERA, as it's commonly referred to, was first introduced in the Florida legislature back in 1972 by Gwyneth Cherry, who was the first black woman to serve in the Florida legislature. 
It has been introduced nearly every year since, and we have been fighting that fight every year since. Lawmakers plan to propose legislation to put the ERA back on the agenda for the 2021 session. If passed, Florida would be the 39th state to ratify the amendment, but it's unclear what that would mean. The deadline for states to ratify the ERA passed long ago, although there are ongoing efforts to have that question answered by Congress. For Capital Update, I'm Giovanni Hampton. And that's it for this edition of Capital Update. We leave you with footage of baby sea turtles at Anastasia State Park struggling to make their way to the ocean and at least one succeeding. Park rangers caution beachgoers to let the sea turtles do their first crawl alone, helping them only harms them. From all of us, thanks for watching. about giving our school supplies to uh, our children in uh, the district, as well as anyone who drives up. We're, we're not being particular about which district they come from. We want to ensure that our children go to school well supplied with, with the, what they need for virtual uh, schooling, uh, which is very different. So it's already a strain on the parents as well as the children. So we just want to make sure they have what they need. What we have left over, we will be donating to the schools because parents are calling the schools for supplies. You ready to go back to school? Today we're doing book bags. This is one step in that direction, making sure kids start getting their supplies, making sure the kids start thinking in terms of going back to school. We want to get back to normal, and that's very key. Neighbors helping neighbors. Just all of us just coming together, helping each other out. We got a lot of volunteers out here that we're very thankful for. Uh, we could be in that line just as easy as we're on this side giving them materials. So we're thankful that we have the health to do it, thankful for all the volunteers, and we want to encourage people. We're going to get through this. We're never going to move our county backwards. We're always going to move forward.
has an important role to reduce and prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our community. Miami-Dade County reminds you to practice social distancing and wear a face covering when in public, even if you think you're perfectly healthy. It's not just about you, it's about protecting everyone around you. Continue to stay home if you're sick or vulnerable. When you do go out, remember to avoid close contact with people and wear your face covering. Stay healthy. For more information, visit miamidade.gov slash coronavirus. Todos somos importantes para ayudar a reducir y prevenir la propagación del COVID-19 en nuestra comunidad. El condado de Miami-Dade te recuerda mantener la distancia social y usar una máscara facial en público. Aunque creas que estás saludable, no se trata solo de ti, sino de todos a tu alrededor. Quédate en casa si estás enfermo o eres vulnerable. Cuando salgas, recuerda evitar el contacto cercano con otras personas y usar tu máscara facial. Cuida tu salud. Más información en miamidade.gov barra coronavirus. Tout le monde a un rôle important pour réduire et empêcher la propagation COVID-19 dans la communauté noire. Quand on est mis à faut songer pour pratiquer distance sociale et puis mettre des masques en public. Même si vous pensez en bonne santé, ce n'est pas pour vous seulement, c'est pour protéger tout le monde qui est aux alentours. Continuez à rester la caillou si vous êtes malade ou soit vulnérable. Si vous sortez dehors, songez pour éviter contact serré avec l'autre monde. Restez en santé. Pour plus d'informations, visitez miamidade.gov oblique coronavirus. Any registered voter in Miami-Dade County eligible to vote in an election may choose to vote by mail. There are several convenient ways to request a vote by mail ballot. 
You may do so online, via email, regular mail, telephone, fax, in person, or via an authorized designee. Requests will be accepted no later than 5 p.m. on the 10th calendar day prior to an election. For example, if you'd like to vote by mail for an election on November 3rd, your request must be made no later than 5 p.m. on October 24th. Once received, the Miami-Dade Elections Department will process your request and your vote by mail ballot will be sent to you by U.S. Mail. When you receive your vote by mail ballot, it's important that you review and follow the instructions carefully. Once you have completed your ballot, place it in the secrecy envelope and then in the outside return envelope. Please read the information on the back of the envelope. It is very important that you sign inside the red box located on the back of the envelope. Your vote by mail ballot is now ready to be returned. You may simply drop it in the mail. For countywide elections, Miami-Dade will provide prepaid postage on the return envelope for your convenience. I'm here to drop off my vote by mail. Sure. You may also choose to deliver your vote by mail ballot in person to the elections office in Doral at any early voting location during operating hours or during countywide elections at the branch office in the lobby of the Stephen P. Clark Center in downtown Miami. You may also have an authorized designee deliver it for you. It is important that you do not give your ballot to anyone unless that person is your authorized designee. Your completed ballot must be received by the Elections Department no later than 7 p.m. on Election Day in order to be counted. All vote-by-mail ballots are processed through an automated mail ballot processing system which captures the signature on the envelope. Once the images have been captured for all incoming vote-by-mail ballots that day, the signature verification process begins. Election staff compares the signature on the envelope with the signature on record to determine whether to accept the ballot or refer it for further review. This is why it's very important that the Elections Department has your current signature on record. If you forgot to sign the envelope or your signature does not match what is on file, Florida law allows you the opportunity to submit an affidavit to cure your vote by mail ballot. The affidavit must be completed and submitted to the Elections Department along with a copy of your identification by 5 p.m. on the second day after an election. After the signature verification process is completed, the accepted vote by mail ballots are stored in a secure area before and after tabulation. All vote-by-mail ballots that are referred for additional review undergo two levels of review. Vote-by-mail staff performs the first review and then the second review is performed by the vote-by-mail manager and the review team, all of whom have attended a signature verification course. Any vote-by-mail ballot that is still referred based on the voter's signature after two levels of review are held in a secure location and prepared for review by the Miami-Dade County Canvassing Board. The canvassing board comprised of three members will make the final determination on whether a ballot is accepted or rejected. Voters whose vote-by-mail ballots were rejected by the canvassing board will be notified by mail by the Elections Department. Make a difference and serve your community as a proud poll worker. Miami-Dade Elections Department needs people like you and me to get involved. I'm Danny. As a proud county employee, it is my duty and pleasure to serve the Elections Department. I enjoy interacting with my fellow colleagues, poll workers, and most importantly, the voters of Miami-Dade County. It is exciting to know that I am making a difference. Poll workers get paid and training is provided. Join the team and learn more at IamElectionReady.org or call 305-499-VOTE.
This is your Miami-Dade Minute. We're here to launch the development.